What's up, everybody? I know we got a small group today. We're just going to go ahead and start. It's 3.30. Pretty quick. Pretty easy. We had something on uh, on brewing safety kind of set up for you guys, but uh, last minute had to reschedule. So we threw this together kind of last night. So it's going to be very brief, very quick, kind of a style profile action. I know we've been hitting hard on competitions and judging and things like that. So a nice break from that now that sunshine's done. So that way it's not too monotonous. Yes, very excited about sunshine. Um, so yeah, summer beers. Um, it's just kind of like a style of profile and some of the ones that are a little bit more popular during summer. Because if you can't tell, it's very hot outside. So really? yes, that's pretty much what our weather forecast is. So, <laughs> So, hey, I, like I don't like the last one. <laughs> yeah. yes. That's actually coming up next Saturday, so yeah. prepare accordingly. Um, so yeah, summer beers. Obviously, when it comes to mind, everyone's kind of got their own rendition of what they think a summer beer is, but usually it's all pretty much the same guidelines. It's light, it's easy drinking, quaffable, if you will, which is one of those fun words I found, so I always throw it in here now. Um, and then usually a lower ABV, so you can kick back a few of them without having to worry to fall off your lawnmower. Session beers. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, um, kind of starting out, like one of the big things I know people think about is wheat beers. And obviously there's a couple different versions out there. With the BJCP, the new rendition, you know, we've got American wheat beers, we've got Belgian wits, we've got German style Hefeweizens, a whole bunch of other ones too, but usually your lighter ones, these are kind of the ones we're just going to kind of go over. Um, so your American wheats, um, a lot of you guys I'm sure are familiar with this. I've seen faces that have probably brewed these a hundred times, and I'm sorry if this is kind of repetitive information, but if you have questions throughout, Please let me know. Um, so yeah, with your American wheats, they're a little bit different than your European wheat beers. They generally uh, less yeast character, a little bit more on the hop character. Um, typically focusing a little bit more on American style hops as well. Um, they obviously lack the phenolics because of that clean yeast, and they still have that like velvety or fluffy kind of mouthfeel to it, even though it is kind of a lower ABV and lower final gravity, as you can see there. What would give them that mouthfeel? So what's that? Typically wheat, I mean, you can even throw things like oats or spelt or things like that in there too. Just something that's a little bit more protein rich outside of just a regular base malt or even some of your roasted malts. Um, but yeah, something like that. Or you can kind of do specific mash temperatures throughout, like stage. Uh, corn will actually kind of just thin out and gives it more of a sweeter kind of taste to it. Um, but hey, it's an American wheat. You know, that, that's if you want to go BJCP standards, they usually don't add corn. But if you want to, go for it. That's, that's what's cool about homebrew. Do whatever you want. Yeah, like I, I recently did a pre-prohibition filter and threw some corn in that, turned out awesome. So, um, so throughout this, we're going to do like a to, to drink and to brew. Um, so with your American wheats, if you don't feel like making one, obviously you can seek some out. Some of those are Bell's Overrun, Boulevard Unfiltered Wheat, Goose Island, you see the 312 almost everywhere. Woodmer Half Bison, they say it's a Half Bison, but for some reason it's listed in the BJCP as an American wheat beer. So there's that. Um, I'm trying to tack on as many local options too throughout the presentation. So you'll see Brewbus, Are We There Yet? That's a really cool one. One of the personal favorite of mine. So if you ever see that out of the mouth, try it out. It's pretty good. Um, backstory for that one it's kind of like a hoppy wheat beer. Um, and I didn't say this, but I heard through the grapevine that when they started brewing that at Cigar City, because Brewbus is kind of, they started their, their home space in Cigar City, um, they had accidentally um, dry hopped their first wheat beer thinking it was high life. So it's got this massive Simcoe nose and this huge grapefruit aroma and all that kind of stuff. And it just kind of defined the style that they made. They just kept making it that way. And it turned out really good. Yeah, so good news. Um, so it's a brew. Um, things that you're typically looking for, about a 60 to 40 wheat malt to pale malt ratio. Um, you can do decoction mashes if you want to. It's not necessary really these days. Um, some people insist on it. Um, you can usually match around 150 to 152. That'll help give you that velvety or fluffy mouthfeel as well, because you can uh, develop some of those long chain sugars in conjunction with that, those higher proteins from your malts. 60-minute um, boil, typically pretty uh, pretty common. Um, clean American bittering hops, and a little bit more towards balance at the end with flavor and aroma. Yeah. A question about brew bus. Is that a bunch of brewers like from Cigar City and all that who got together and started a company called? So, as best as I know, and this is all secondhand information that I found uh, through, you know, working with Brown and stuff like that. Um, essentially, Brewbus was started by Anthony, and Anthony is the uh, the president's uh, son of Cigar City. So he had come back. He was actually running a, a Brewbus um, company over in Boulder, over in Boulder, 
And when he came back to Tampa, he actually wanted to start something up. So in having that business where you kind of go around and you, you sightsee a lot of the breweries in the area, he wanted to have some beers on the bus available for the patrons. So he contract brewed, I think it was uh, Are We There Yet? and Rolling Dirty, which is an Irish red style, through Cigar City. So he, they were making it there for a while. Uh, he then moved that after about two years to Brew Hub, started making a lot of them there. That's where he, uh, he introduced Double Decker, which is a porter, and also the uh, You're My Boy, or My Boy Blue, or You're My Boy Blue, which is the uh, blueberry wheat beer that they do. Um, and then after doing that for a few years, he actually recently bought the old Florida Avenue Brewery um, down in Tampa. So they actually have uh, their own tasting room. They're still kind of brewing over at Brew Hub last I saw them, which was about a month ago. Um, but they're starting to transition over and get their actual brew house in, in house set up. So, does that help? Yeah, I thought Josh Bringle and, and Joey, uh, Anthony, Joey's dad had something to do with it too, or something. And it's actually Anthony's mom who's the president of Cigar City on, on paper. Uh, but yeah, obviously with Josh Pringle, I think it was Josh Pringle who helped him come up with Last Stop, which is the IPA recipe, um, possibly uh, You're My Boy Blue. Um, you have to ask them, but that's just from what I heard. So obviously they were they were involved because they were contract brewing for different things. So, um, but yeah, going through that, um, Clean American Hops, obviously just the clean bittering charge. You can do something like Magnum or you know Columbus or something like that. Um, and then you know. Use your imagination. Find something fun. They typically balance, or they typically lean more towards like your American ones, like you know. Well, using, well, what's that? Well, I'm not trying to say that. It's yeah. that was, but I'm not gonna lie. That's all right. <laughs> oh, but yeah. So you typically want to ferment with a clean ale yeast at about 66 to 68. You can go higher, but then you're risking that fruity ester kind of like fruit bomb kind of technique going on, and those typically don't really do well with the American ones. Uh, so Belgian wit beers, obviously another wit beer that everyone's very, very familiar with. Um, Four hundred year old recipe that you know nearly died out in the nineteen fifties until um, Pierre Sellis kind of helped bring it back up with uh, Hoogarden, then transferred over to Oma Gang and then Sellis and all this kind of stuff. I'm sure you're pretty familiar with that background too. Um, honestly, it's one of those ones where not only did Sellis kind of help out, but a lot of the big beer companies helped out with this one too. You know, everyone's got their opinion as far as. You know, Big Bad InBev or Big Bad Miller Coors, but at the end of the day, this wouldn't be as popular as it is without things like Blue Moon or Shock Top or things like that, realistically. Um, so, um, again, fluffy, velvety mouthfeel, complex on the phenolics because of the yeast use, um, high carbonation, and sometimes slightly acidic. Um, some of those yeasts actually have a, a little bit more of a lactic kind of acidic kind of component to them, so they'll, they'll dry it out a little bit more. Uh, some of your stats right there, obviously very, very low in ABV, 4.5 to 5%. Um, all the other boring stuff that you can look up in the BJCP guide. Is there any clove, uh, clove, any clove that like that's, beer? So, so that typically is a little bit more reminiscent of German style Hefeweizens, but you can get that out of it depending on the yeast that you're using. Uh, clove or like four vinyl guayacol, I think, is usually due to a precursor that's done in the mash uh, right around 110 degrees. Um, so if you want to do a step kind of uh, decoction aspect, then you can actually uh, manipulate your flavor profile from the yeast by doing that, by building a little bit more of those precursors. Um, so, and we can get into that a little bit more on another one, but, or if you have other questions, feel free to come to me after this. But, does that help? Yes. Awesome. Well, turning on the other question we were talking about earlier. Gotcha, okay. Awesome. Um, so again, to drink or to brew. Um, so if you feel like going out and just getting your hands on one, obviously Hoog Garden, very, very popular example. Um, one of the ones, again, where Pierre Sellers kind of helped out really bringing it back up to the 1950s. Um, Oma Gang, they're a, a Belgian traditional brewery out of Cooperstown, New York. If you haven't tried things from them, do it. They're amazing. Oh my God. Um, Whitaker, obviously, launched to Brussels. Um, and then some of the local ones are obviously Cigar City, Florida Cracker. And I only put Swamp Head up there because it's one of the only ones I know of that's local year round. Uh, it is kind of a selfish promotion, per se. Um, or to brew. Um, so you can typically get away with a 50 50 or a 60 40 of unmalted or white wheat to uh, filter malt. Um, I've actually used a torrified white wheat before, where it's like pre-gel or gelatinized, uh, which worked out really well too. Um, you can do about five to ten percent oats if you want to kind of help with that mouthfeel as well. Um, I usually throw some rice hulls in there, just because with a lot of that protein-rich, uh, those protein-rich grains going on, you, if you're susceptible to a stuck sparge, um, this is a really big bill that will possibly do that to you. Um, Mash around 150, maybe about even lower than that, maybe 148, just kind of get it super dried out. 60-minute um, boil. 
Coriander and orange peel are typically added. You don't have to. Um, and then also in uh, radical brewing from Randy Mosher, I think he even talks about doing lavender, chamomile, and things like that. Which, you know, if you've got the base style down, you want to try some other stuff, go for it. Throw all that other stuff in there, see how it works out. Um, coriander, usually about 0.4 ounces per five gallons, or, and orange peel about one to two ounces in the last five gallons, or in five gallons for the last five minutes. Um, a lot of people on some of the, uh, some of the forums I was, I was reading over, and actually my own personal experience as well, the, the dried up stuff that you can buy at some of the homebrew shops and stuff like that, they work well, they are traditional. Um, a lot of people have found better results with actually going out and buying oranges or tangerines and things like that and actually just doing the, you know, yeah, zesting them themselves. Make sure you don't get that white pithy part so you don't get that like astringent kind of um, which is a scientific term. Yeah, just the zest. Um, but yeah, both white yeast and white labs both make a wit yeast. Um, and you can ferment anywhere from 68 to 75, depending on the Belgian yeast strain that you get, you might even be able to get to go higher. Um, I did one with a uh, white yeast farmhouse ale, um, and fermented that at about 80 degrees, finished up in like four days, and uh, one second over at Ogden. So it worked out pretty well. Um, Hefeweizen. Um, I threw in the pronunciation thing just because it's kind of a, I used to take German, um, and obviously I'm kind of German from the background. Um, so. W's, they don't have an actual W sound in German language, and your Z is like a T-S sound, much like the end of like cats. So it's Peppa Weizen. Yeah, so. Um, obviously rich and complex with notes of banana and clove. Um, this was a, obviously with the Reinheitsgebot, they, they put this into action to where this was typically made only for royalty, that they kind of bypassed that uh, by adding wheat and things like that. But it was more popularized by a commercial example brewed by Schneider, uh, in 1872, which is kind of what you'll see over here. Um, since then, obviously, they do crystal bites, dunkel bites, they do um, bites and box, uh, they do a hoppy bites in with, uh, with Brooklyn Brewery. If you see those, try them, they're awesome. Um, again, boring stuff, but still falling into 4.3 to 5.6, lower ABV, not going to knock you out your lung. Okay. To drink or to brew? Um, obviously, Germans have been doing this extremely well for hundreds of years, so why break tradition? They're trying them out. They're pretty solid. Eidinger does a great job. Holliner, Schneiderweiss, uh, Erdinger, Tucker, there's a whole mess of them out there, guys. I'm sure you're familiar with those. Um, Funky Buddha, uh, one of the only local options I know of year around within Florida um, that you can kind of go out and buy. I think they actually just took gold uh, in the, not gold, no, that was a, uh, Crooked Can actually just took gold in the Hefeweizen with Best Florida Beer. So there's another one you can go check out. Oh, sorry. Uh, to brew, again, 60-40 malted wheat, Pilsner malt. Again, decoction is not necessary, but some people really insist on it to kind of get that bready toastiness. Yes, sir? You said that the recipe that was like 400 years old, mm -hmm. how has the, okay, the recipe is the same, but how has the process of making the beer really changed? Has it changed dramatically, or has it really maintained like the same equipment, the same So. I'll answer that to the best of my abilities. I don't have experience in a lot of that, nor have I looked up, but so far as what I've read on a lot of other stuff, um, you know, this was Hefeweizen yeast itself kind of developed because it was more of a top cropping yeast. So essentially they would be done with more open fermentation. Um, so you would basically, as a German brewer within those days, instead of having like a big stainless controlled tank, and after seven days it's knocked out and you take your readings or whatever, they basically had just giant, you know, wooden vessels where they would pitch it in the vessels would still have yeast residual in them, but they would also harvest yeast by at high Krausen, whenever the fermentation was going on, they would take yeast off of that and basically take that and dump it into a new batch, and that was basically their yeast starter, essentially, right? Um, so all, there's that aspect in mind. So it's not that it was a, a lack of sanitation or anything. It was just a, a lack of understanding as far as what yeast did. They knew they needed to take uh, the, the magic going on from this liquid and put it into this liquid so it would start. Um, like a bread. Yeah, exactly. Um, so then you also run into things like with the decoction mash um, that used to be necessary to go through your acid rests, your protein rests, your sacrification rests, and all these different kind of things. With the way that malt has been specialized these days, it's not exactly necessary anymore. You know what I mean? So you don't need to worry about going through your acid to break down to X stage and then your protein to break down Y stage. It can typically be done with a single infusion now. So, does that help? Yes. Cool. Um, yeah, so again, consider rice holes. I would throw that out there for any wheat beer. 
doesn't really do anything to your flavor. They are super cheap, and they will save you a giant headache if your sparks get stuck. Just Unless you brew in a bag, then you don't need rice Unless you brew in a bag, yeah, then you don't need rice holes. But then at the same time, you need to take into account your efficiency because your protein-rich grains are then going to soak up more water and become a little bit more gelatinized and hold a lot more of that more into the bag. What is decoction? Is traditionally necessary? So decoction is, is basically like a multi-stage where you would essentially start out at like a, you know an acid rest from anywhere from 110 to 120 degrees. And that would be like maybe... Forget the times on them, so if I get it wrong, please excuse me. Yeah, that one's about 15 minutes. You would then do a protein rest for about 30 minutes, so to get it up from 110 to 120-ish, up to the 130-ish needed for the protein, you would take some of it out, you would boil that, you would put it back in, and that would raise the temperature. So then you set it at that, and that's your protein rest. And then to bring it up to sacrification, which is your 148 to 150 or whatever they suggest, um, you would then have to take out another portion, boil that, add that back to it to reach your other mass temperature. Know what I mean? So it's a very, very long day. I did it once. I will never do it again unless it's absolutely necessary and my life depends on it. When you take that, that board out, you boil it, doesn't it? Stop. Even with meat beers, doesn't it stop the mash? Essentially, yes. Um, but you're taking so little amount out. Um, you're, it's like maybe about a quart or two to boil that and just bring it back up to temp. You can't add heat to the pot? Well, you're, you're you not, can, you're but, pot. yeah, exactly. But at that point, they weren't. So essentially, they're, they're brewing this giant vessel, sure, sure. and then they basically take it out and throw it in there, they put it on fire, put it, in, put it back in. So that's kind of where the decoction comes from. And it used to be necessary because the type of malts that they were using weren't specialized nearly as much as they are now. Because I do a protein press when you put it in a bag. Mm -hmm. start at 126, add the grain, go to 122, and I'll take that for 30 minutes. Then I crank up the fire, and yeah. bag it a little bit until I get to a fine. Gotcha. Yeah, and again, I've only done the decoction once, so I don't, I don't really do anything other than single infusions these days. Um, but yeah, so with those, uh, going back, mesh um, yeah, so that's it. Does that help with the decoction idea? Awesome. Um, so 150, 154, that'll kind of help again with the long chain sugars. Um, noble hops, obviously. Um, it's not a hop driven style, so don't go overboard with them. You know, I would honestly say a little bit for flavor at 10 minutes, and then most of it just kind of being your bitter in charge just for balance, to be honest with you. Um, obviously, white or white yeast and white labs both have a Weizen yeast. Some do Weizenstefan, some do you know white specifically. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, of back and forth on forums about under pitching yeast and what temperatures and this that or whatever. Um, realistically, if you're just starting out, throw the bag in there or make a starter, kind of do that. Um, one thing that I did find and that I know a lot of people have had issues with on their their Hefeweizens is they typically ferment too high. Those Weizen yeasts can actually go down to the low 60s. Uh, somebody even recommended on one of the forums to try it at 62, and the guy said basically he'd been making Weizens for about two years, he wasn't happy with the results, heard that bit of advice, tried it out, didn't think it would work, but it was wonderfully like, complex and all this kind of stuff, he's well balanced. Uh, because by doing it too high, this yeast is very susceptible to making a precursor for isomal acetate, uh, which is isomal alcohol. Um, and then the yeast doesn't actually reabsorb, or the yeast will actually reabsorb that and turn it into isomal acetate, so you get like a banana bomb essentially if you go too high with this one. Um, most, and again, clove, what we were talking about earlier, this is kind of dedicated to that balance of clove phenolics from the yeast to that banana yeast flavor. It's not that you don't want it, but there is a threshold where it is a problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah. What's that? You don't want to attract a tree of monkeys. Yeah, exactly. Plus, uh, isomal acetate is actually used in uh, the food and beverage industry as a flavoring for a lot of banana flavored items. Um, I remember growing up, I hated banana runs more than anything in the world, and it's still to this day why I won't drink Hefeweizens, because if it's too much of an isomal acetate bomb, all I think is banana runs. Press me up. Uh, session IPAs. This isn't exactly a style by BJCP guidelines, but obviously everyone's seen them. They're out and about. We've got one today from Chris. Who's a guest? Welcome, Chris. Possible new member. Um, so session IPAs are coming a big thing. A lot of breweries are coming out with these, um, and just from being in the industry, they do very, 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 very well uh, with the off-premise. So it doesn't do a lot for like you know on draft and bars and stuff like that. But for people just kind of going up to 7-Eleven or going over to ABC, these are flying out the door. Um, uh, and with the IPA aspect, what's that? The founders is excellent. Oh, dude, founders all day is like one of my go-tos. There's always one of those in my fridge at all times. Um, so, obviously, easy drinking, super low ABV, 
Um, often called the Brewer's Beer. I was talking to Chris over at Greenbench, who came out with the uh, the Micro, which is like a 3.2% or like a, even, a, I don't know, I think at one time it was a 2%. Uh, like session IPA. So he was basically like, I love IPAs and I like going on the boat. And I wanted to make something that I could drink all day on the boat and not have to worry about falling off the boat. So, usually called Brewer's Beers because of that reason. Um, high perceived hoppiness. So the alpha acids aren't typically crazy high in these kind of beers, but because of the amount of hops used later by hop bursting, if you will, um, you'll typically get a very a uh, big perceived hop aroma and sensation without actually utilizing a lot of the alpha and acid con contents to it. Uh, again, OG, subjective. Final gravity, subjective, because they're not really a style on guidelines. Um, but IBUs, you typically find 30 to 45. SRM is usually really low because you don't have crystal malts in there. You don't really have Munich malts in there. And it can do with very small amounts. Um, and then ABVs are anywhere from 3.2 to about 5%. At that point, it's really a okay. So to drink, if you're trying to go out and get an idea as far as, you know, if you're trying to get ideas as far as uh, making up your own recipe, again, Founders All Day, that's one of the go-to ones for sure. The go-to from Stone is a really good one, and they actually, on the back of their bottle, kind of uh, talk about their hop bursting technique that they do as well, kind of achieve what they do. Um, that one is heavily driven by, hello, hello, there we go. That one is heavily driven by uh, Citra Hops. So if you're a fan of Citra Hops, definitely go try that one out. Um, Boulevard Pop-Up. Um, which is kind of hard to find. I think they discontinued that. Some local options. Um, if you guys are into kind of going out and finding uh, new beers that are being posted and stuff like that, check out uh, Cigar City Central Florida Facebook page. Um, they recently came out with LGBT, uh, which was standing for Let's Get Beers Together. And they're doing... Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. So they're actually doing specialty tappings throughout the Central Florida area. And all the proceeds from that beer are going to uh, Orlando United for you know the Pulse victim shootings and things like that. So I strongly recommend it. The beer is awesome. Um, so just kind of keep an eye out. So you can actually give back by drinking beer, which you would have already done anyway. So uh, we make one called Day Trippin'. Again, shameless plug. Sorry. Um, Funky Buddha does one called Crusher. You'll see it pop up every now and then. And then Green Bench again with the micro. Um, to brew it, again, low bittering charge. You want a lot of your, your bitterness to come from the perceived bitterness from your late bittering additions. Um, hop bursting, there's still kind of, uh, you can read through forums, everyone's kind of got a, a different idea as far as what it means, but in general it just means usually the last 15 to 10 minutes is where you're throwing the bulk of your hops in, and where you're getting a lot of not only your, your alpha acid content, but a massive amount of your beta acid content, which is kind of your big aroma and floral notes. In the boil, or are they using a hop um, you can do that. That's the thing. Like you can, it, there's really not a specific way to do that these days. So if you've got a specific way that you like to do um, late edition hops in your beers, go that way. I personally, like, I don't like to dry hop that a lot, so I do a lot more in the Whirlpool edition. That's just kind of what I do. Uh, but I know a lot of people who they love their hop rocket or their hop back and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, so you can also do the Whirlpool hops, which is kind of what I just mentioned. Um, if you've got a setup that you can do like that on your uh, on your brew setup, essentially like 180 to 120-ish for about 20 minutes, just do a massive amount of hops in there. You'll get a huge floral, like or not floral, but aroma and nose and flavor without a lot of that um, alpha acid content. Um, clean ale yeast usually, you don't want to, it's not really a yeast driven style. You want something just super clean. It's basically meant to showcase hops without you having to scrape your tongue off. Um, with your malt bill though, because if you, if you make something that small and dry it out that much, you're going to need something to add a little bit more mouthfeel. You can use oats, you can use white wheat, um, you can use spelt. Um, even if you're doing something on a smaller scale and you don't have like an all-grain stuff, you're doing a lot of like just kind of uh, like uh, you know extracts and stuff. Maltodextrin, if you've never used it, check it out. This will actually bump up the uh, the residual gravity of your of your beer um, by adding more sugar, but it's not perceived as sweet. So you can tip. That's a small amount though. Like one teaspoon to five gallons. Maybe. No, you can typically do a little bit more. Um, I recently did one like on that the white stuff that we poured at the uh, the event. I did some maltodextrin in the back end, and that was uh, eight ounces for five gallons. So it, I, I don't know what the ratio is. You'd have to look it up, but it's a little bit more. Like typically about four ounces will add like maybe two or three points to your round. So. Colches. Everyone loves colches. Uh, there's a very famous saying in the industry that um, every there's the, the evolution of beer drinkers, right? And you start out either a big malty or big hoppy, and you move through your Imperial Stouts and double IPAs, then you go to Belgians, then you go to Sours, 
And then you go turn it back right on right around and go to Pilsner's or Colchins, because at the end of the day you just want something that tastes good and you don't really want to think about it. You're it's not about it at all. Um, Kolsch's, if you're not familiar with this style, it is a German-driven uh, style. It's one of the, uh, the very few ale slash lager hybrids. Um, so with the Kolsch yeast, it's been kind of uh, it's evolved a little over time to kind of operate at lower ale temperatures, but it's still a lager yeast on paper, right? So you're going to get a little bit more of that mellowed out, smooth, crisp kind of uh, texture from the lager itself, but you're also going to get a little bit of those estuary assertiveness kind of characteristics from the ale parts as well. Um, this was developed to kind of combat a lot of the, uh, the bottom fermenting lagers that were encroaching on southern Germany at the time. And it was, uh, and again, market always dictates new styles. I don't know if you know that. This is one of those ones where they saw it coming in, it was selling better than what they were making. It was like, I don't know how to do that, let's do this. And it worked out really well. Um, protected by the Kolsch Convention. Um, to be called a Kolsch, it needs to come from Kuhn, or Kuhn in Germany, if you will. Um, there are only about 20 breweries that can actually make these commercially and have the right to do them. Um, other than that, it's typically just called a golden ale or Kolsch style. So, a lot of American ones that are doing it on paper aren't technically Kolsch's, but that's all here. Uh, the boring stuff, but again, low ABVs. IBUs are typically a little bit higher because they do kind of have a little bit more assertiveness to balance out that extra uh, estuary profile. So, I'll look at that side. Okay. Um, again, if you want to go out and drink it and not worry about making it, then look for things like Gaffel Kolsch. Rise door Kolsch, uh, Fru Kolsch. Um, always check your dates on those if you're buying them though, please. Because a lot of times, uh, if you go to something like a Total Wine, not saying that they're not trying to sell them, remove them, but typically those are the slower moving items and those can kind of age out fairly quickly. So, um, also some of the ones that are being made kind of locally, Terrapin Golden Ale, they do one every summer. Uh, not summer, I think it's spring, but they do one that's awesome. Uh, Ocean Sun, if you haven't been over there, they've got a Kolsch, and I think they actually have a peach treatment on it at the moment, which turned out really well. Uh, Crooked Can also has one, Mr. Tracker, which they recently started canning, so definitely check that out. And uh, again, Shameless Blood Founders. Founders has a chamomile Founders, yeah, Founders recently did, it was, a, it was a very small release within the area, but they did a chamomile and, and lemon peel. Yeah, lemon peel and chamomile, right? Trifecta Perfecta, which was a, uh, a specialty like chamomile and lemon peel Kolsch. It didn't suck. It was really good. Yeah, so Food Wine had it. A couple of like specialty founders events had it as well. Um, to brew it, what's up? Well, we're just releasing it coming up this month. Shameless plug. Um, so to brew it. You're looking at things like German pale or Pilsner malts. Uh, some of the things you read might suggest that you throw things like uh, like wheat in there up to 20%. That is not really traditional. It's kind of fallen from the wayside. Do it if you want, but that's kind of not what a lot of people are doing these days. Um, noble hops, typically. Um, obviously, like Tetmanger, Saz, things like that. Um, something with a big, pungent, like spicy, fruity floral aroma going on. Um, you can mash around 150. You don't want to do it too dry because then the balance is really lacking, so you kind of want to go in the middle. It may seem a little weird since it is kind of a, a style dictated by how light, refreshing, and crisp it is, but you want to make sure you've got balance at the end of the day. Uh, fermentation temperature is key with this. You want to do low 60s, possibly high 50s. Keep an eye on it. If you've got the, the potential to do that, you know, start it low and then kind of ramp it up. Every time I've ever made one, it's a slow starter. It takes like two days to start seeing any activity going on. Um, that could be due to pitching rates. I usually just do a starter in like a three to five gallon batch. Maybe it needs more, but um, typically it's it's kind of a slow starter. But once it gets going, it's good. So you don't need a lager yeast to do this. You, need to... you can do a lager yeast at a higher temperature, but then you're kind of you're kind of running the gambit on it. Like I used a bohemian lager yeast on it before, and it turned out really well. Now I'd want to use an ale yeast for the higher temperature if I can do it. This again is dec or dictated by the fact that it is one of those hybrid styles. It was a lager yeast that was modified to kind of start doing well at higher temperature. So, Bohemia Lager does really well. It's, Both, a German, uh, it's a German steam. Yeah, essentially it's a German steam. Um, German or pretty much like a Pilsner made with a, like a slightly more like a evolved yeast. Um, but white yeast and white lots both make either German ale or uh, or coal yeasts. So, and those typically work out pretty well. So. Pilsners! Everyone knows them, everyone loves them. They've recently changed to Czech pale lagers or Czech premium pale lagers if you're getting all fancy on it. But uh, 
it's pretty much the same kind of thing going on. Classic intro to craft beers. If you got friends who are trying to get into it, or if you want one of those like still good beers, but kind of a thoughtless beer, always an easy route, route to go. Known for assertive bit or, uh, bitterness while still being delicate. Ready, doughy malt character. Um, I think a lot of times people forget that with a style like this, there is supposed to be malt character in there. And it usually comes from your fills or malts. You'll get like a cereal doughy graininess going on if it's done well. Um, assertive noble hot bitterness. Obviously, it kind of dictates the style. Um, originated in 1842 by Pilsner Herbfeld. Again, kind of uh, made up to compete with a lot of those German bottom fermented type of pale lagers that were coming into the market. Um, all the boring stuff. But again, IBUs, as you can tell, are pretty high at 30 to 45. Uh, 4.2 to 5.8%, which still puts us in like a sessionable-ish area. Except for that 5.8, so it's important to read your ABV, so be careful. So, uh, if you want to go out and grab one to drink, um, Pilsner or Quo, obviously classic example. You got Yiver, which is from uh, Germany, which I think is more of a German Pilsner, but along the same lines. Um, you went to Pils, just came out. I think Red Light has it. Last time I saw it on Facebook, that was jumping out. Uh, Left Hand Polestar is a really good example. And Six Point does a really good job on uh, one of theirs, too. You typically find those like ABCs, Total Wines, things like that. Uh, to brew it, uh, typically softer water is, uh, is kind of required. So if you're getting into water chemistry, maybe buy like distilled and kind of build it up from there if you're confident with doing that. Um, one of those ones to where if you're making it with tap water, maybe kind of dilute it a little bit. You know what I mean? Um, low sulfates, saucer type, or type hops, obviously, like saws or, you know, tap or things like that. Um, check lager yeasts, bohemian lager yeast from Y yeast. That is my only experience with doing a pilsner. It turned out really well, but there's a lot of different ones out there, obviously. Um, pills and carapils mold are typically the only things you're going to find in there. A lot of times it's tempting to kind of try to raise up the breadiness by adding Munich or raise up a little bit of sweetness in the, in the profile by adding some crystal. Don't do that. Just go with the classic example. Less is more with this example. Uh, lager fermentation tips anywhere from 50 to 55. You can go higher if you want, but you know, when you lager, it takes a while to find your sweet spot. And once you found it, stick to that. Excuse me. And then last but not least, if you're new to lagering, always check your cell count and your pitch rates. You'll typically want about twice as much as you would do with a nail. So if you're going out and you're used to maybe buying a smack pack or a, a little dry yeast pack and you typically dump those into your ales, buy two or make a starter. But definitely make sure that you, you have more in there because it will stall and it will cause problems. Okay, anybody? Personal experience? Yeah. Uh, shandies. Again, not one of the styles that, that is on BJCP, but something that is becoming very popular uh, in summertime. Um, shand What's that? Yeah, I've, I actually heard that one, and I tried it. It's actually pretty good. It doesn't sound like it would be good, but it's pretty solid. Um, so obviously, everyone's got to get their own take as far as what they think a shandy should be, and you'll find a lot of different ones, like a Heppy and Coke, like we mentioned. Uh, Hefeweizen and Lemonade is very popular. Lagers and grapefruit juice, or lagers and sodas, like Sprites, or get creative. It's fun. It's pretty much one of those things you just kind of go on a whim. Um, if you want to drink some, Schniegel Rattler is by all time my favorite Rattler beer ever, or uh, Shandy beer ever. If you haven't tried it, go check it out. Yes? Um, down in the South Florida, in the Keys of the Caribbean, there's a ginger shandy. Yep. If you can ever get a hold of it, I mean, buy cases of it because it is just ultimately delicious. And that is the closest thing to this beer that I have ever come to enjoy. Really? It's a ginger shandy. Nice, man. Yeah, ginger shandies are big. Um, I've even seen like cream soda shandies before. Um, it's just all about how you want to kind of mix it up. Narragansett comes out with uh, a lemon shandy every year. Curious Traveler basically builds their entire brand on shandies, so you'll see like a pumpkin shandy and an apple shandy and a lemon shandy and all these different things. Uh, Lottie Kugels, everyone knows, but some uh, some popular ones you might find from local. Yes. Having grown up in England, drinking shandy. Yes, give me more. Drinking shandy at sixteen, it was mild and lemonade and fun. Okay. <laughs> I understand completely. Really shandy is, um, I think, lemonade and mild. It's a bitter and Sprite. So bitter and Sprite or lemonade and mild. It's, it's like, not lemonade, sorry, it's Sprite. Sprite, okay. So again, another example, like, and I'm just the messenger. These are things I found on forums. <laughs> but it gives you a really good interpretation as far as how everyone has a specific way they typically do it. So. Um, usually whenever you're making it at home, it's not a very easy thing to do. You can try, if you, oh I'm sorry, back to the, the local ones, keep an eye out, if you want to try some ones from local, always support local, 
Two South Rattlers, a pretty solid one. I think they just kind of came out with it about a month ago. You can still find it on shelves. Barley Mo just came out with Calliope, which is a, uh, a lemon and cherry, tart cherry. So, um, again, to brew, these are difficult to brew at home because a lot of times it, it, it involves adding more sugar content in secondary or to mix. And everyone knows that whenever you do that, you risk that secondary fermentation aspect. So your best bet to do is typically just like make solid lager or make a solid wheat beer and kind of blend it at your own discretion. This isn't really one of those ones where, you know, you can do it in the keg. You can essentially just keg up like a lager and add some, you know, orange juice or a mild and add some, some Sprite. Um, and that would essentially be it. But you would never really be able to package it and let it be stable because it would then go into secondary fermentation and explode. So... <laughs> So Berliners, and I added Florida Vice because I know it's not really a thing on guidelines, but it is a thing if you're from Florida, you've seen it. And it's kind of becoming a, a style that we're really known for here in our state. Uh, so Berliner Vices, obviously it kind of, kind of comes with a little bit more of an advanced brewing technique. If you've never really played with lactobacillus or, sa or lactobacillus or sours and things like that, definitely do a lot of reading. I strongly suggest American Wild Ales from Michael Tonsmeyer. Um, he, made, he literally just makes it so simple to where you read it and you're like, oh, that's it. That's all I got to do. Um, but the, the style itself is, is usually known for its lactic tartness um, because of the fact that it has lactobacillus in there. It drops the pH as its uh, self-defense mechanism, and therefore you get a slightly more tart beer. Um, kind of a, a thing that I like to point out, uh, just because it's sour, don't expect funk. Don't expect vinegar because I know we're still on this precipice of understanding sours. This is one of those styles to where it's more of a sensory kind of thing. It's not really a flavor component. And if you really want to delve into whether or not it's a flavor component, um, you're maybe getting some lemon, some lime citrusiness. Um, but at best, it's more of like a sensory aspect as opposed to like an acetic acid or a bread acid or something like that. Kind of like plain yogurt. Yeah, exactly. Like, like if you have Greek yogurt or plain yogurt, that tartness that's there, it's not necessarily a flavor. It's more of a sensory kind of thing. That's lactic acid. So they actually use lactobacillus to make yogurt, obviously. Was up at the uh, Thirsty Tober, and they had a cucumber vice, and I, I, I thought it was a vice, and I tasted it. I'm like, this ain't a vice. Was it from Coppertail? I'm not sure who it was from. But yeah, that was, yeah, that was actually. I had that with you, remember? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So that brings us to our next. Oh, wait, just real quick. No for lactic tartness. Again, usually Pilsner malt and wheat malts that are in there. Um, again, there still needs to be some other components other than just tart. There needs to be a bready, multi flavor to it. There needs to be a, a zero hops note I added that in, because if you're familiar with brewing these, lactobacillus does extremely poor in high uh, acidic environments with alpha acids in them. Um, so typically these have almost zero hops to the point to where I've seen some uh, brewers where whenever they make these, they just take like one pellet and they throw it in. They're like, now it's beer, and that's it. So, so you typically, like I said, you find your IBUs anywhere from three to eight, which is almost unperceived, really. So. Um, ABV ranges from anywhere from 2.8 to 3.8 percent. Cigar City does a really cool one called the One Percenter. I don't know if you've ever been down to their tasting room. They have that on. It's a one percent for Lunar Vice, which I would literally I would replace water with that in my diet because it's so good. <laughs> if you want to drink it, commercial ex uh, examples that you'll find: Bell's Oarsman recently came out in the can. Awesome! Oh my God, that is the, literally the beer that turned me on to this style with Bell's Oarsman. Um, 1809 is a Berliner Vice, which kind of goes outside the guidelines. Um, it's about like a five and a half percent per liter, but it's still sessionable, more or less. Um, Copper tail, like we were talking about, does a cucumber. They do elderberry. They do. I, did a, I had a pink lemonade one from them once, and they they figured out uh, kettle souring essentially. If you go so down to the, if you go down to the brewery, there's usually at least four on draft. Yeah, they usually have about four, if not a base. Then they have four other versions of Florida Vice. Um, so that that difference between Berliner and Florida Vice, essentially, it's a Berliner Vice or Berliner Vice base. With a massive amount of fruit additions to it. Um, Copper Tail is actually out of Tampa, um, which you've never been down there. Go check it out. Aesthetically, that is one of the coolest looking tap rooms you'll ever see in your life. Um, and their system, if you're a big like system nerd, um, the guy basically has an automated system to where you can sit on a couch and be like, I want to make 17.2 barrels of an IPA, and just walk away. And it just does everything. Um, Jay, or Jay Wakefield Brewing, uh, he's kind of credited with uh, pioneering, I wouldn't say inventing this, but pioneering this style essentially with the Florida Vice aspect. If you're ever down in South Florida, check it out. He knows what he's doing. Um, if you ever saw when Cigar City started coming out with Berliners like Stiff Tongue and things like that, 
that was actually because John, or Jay, Jake Wakefield was actually interning at Cigar City at the time and asked to be able to do that on their system. And so they just kept doing it because it turned out really well. Um, to brew it, again, half wheat, half pills. Um, typically does fairly well. You can do a little bit more on the pill side if you want, um, but it is a pretty even mixture of both of those. Um, low hop bitterness again because your lactobacillus will not actually thrive in that environment. Um, if you're familiar with brewing with lacto, then you know I won't go into the specifics, but do yourself a favor and read into a lot of variables if you're attempting this style for the first time. Um, check your pH of your wort before you pitch your lactobacillus, because that can stave off a lot of other like Entobacter and, and actually botulism kind of organisms. Um, make sure that you've got the right temperature. You can't just pitch it and leave it at like 68 degrees, because then you're going to get a weird kind of a lot of off um, Make sure it's in an anaerobic environment. It does not do well with oxygen. If it has that in there, it'll still do its thing, but it'll also make a lot of disgusting, ugh, like cheesy, stinky, feedy, disgusting notes in your beer. I know that because I messed up a lot of them before I perfected it. Um, and then also faux sours. This is a real, like, a lot of people knock on this, but this is a really easy way to start making some sour beers without having to worry about getting into, uh, you know, the complexities of having to deal with different organisms. Um, I've actually done fairly well with some recipes where I just make, like, a, what would be your Berliner Weiss base with clean ale yeast, and then whenever I'm actually bottling it or kegging it, I just buy a little vial of 88% lactic acid from the homebrew shop, I keep pouring it in, I keep trying it. And then when it's sour enough, I throw the cap on it, I carbonate it, and it kind of tastes like a Berliner Weiss. Uh, so much so that not many people pick up on the fact that it's not. So, um, advanced technique with an understanding of lactobacillus, we could have talked about that already. If you have any questions, obviously, you know, come up to somebody who's like obviously Rob Weeder. Um, I'm not a genius in it, but I can give you some pointers as far as what I messed up on. Um, American Wild Ales from Michael Townsmeyer is a really good opportunity. His whole, uh, his whole blog, the, uh, the Mad Fermentation, is a really, really good uh, resource point for finding like what to do with the uh, lactic. Um, things to remember, obviously, about session beers. Um, play your ukulele. Um, again, they're quaffable. All of them are, are all about balance, essentially. Again, low ABV. And these are really easy styles to brew, guys. Even outside of the Berliner, like you can do the faux Berliner. It's really easy to do at home. Um, and then, yeah, that's pretty much it. So uh, the 2015 guidelines is where I get a lot of information and BYO on the website and then a lot of my own mess ups. So uh, if you have any questions, let me know.